Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 285. Please turn to it. Page number 285, the very first problem that you see there in the second column, number 116. Let's see what it has to say. In number 116, we are told that a company is taking a, a whole bunch of people are going on a cruise uh, that belong to the, to the company. And we are told that the people who are going to the, on the cruise, we are told that two-thirds of them are employees. We are also told that the rest are guests. We are told that the rest of the people going on the cruise are the guests of the employees who are going on the cruise, which means one-third are guests. They further go on to tell us that of the people who are employees, of the people who are employees, three quarter we are told are managers. Which means that the remaining one quarter are non-managers as they put it. And the question simply is, how many of these people are there? How many, how many of the company's employees who are going on the cruise happen not to be the managers? That's all it is. Let's see, let's see what they tell us, shall we? In the statement one they tell us that there are a total of 690 people on the cruise. Total of 690 people on the cruise. Well, we know that, that uh, one third of them are guests, one third of them are guests, and therefore two thirds of them are employees. So two thirds of 690 is very easy to figure out. Divide by three, we get two, three, and zero. 230 times two. 230 times 2 is 460. 460 employees of the people who are going on the cruise. 690 people are going on the cruise and we found out that of the 690, 460 are company employees. Here we go. We have to simply take one quarter of that amount and that will be the non-employees. One quarter of that amount, 460 divided by 4 is simply 115. This part that we just did was not necessary. Of course, if we know 460, we can figure out the quarter. The first statement by itself is enough. The first statement by itself is quite sufficient. Now that we established the first statement by itself does the job nicely, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It will have to be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Let's look at second statement. Let's just leave it here. In the second statement, they tell us. In the second statement, they tell us that two thirds, two two hundred and thirty of them are guests. In the second statement, they're telling us that 230 people who are going on the cruise are guests. Well, if 230 of them are guests, and they, in the beginning we know that one third of them are guests, that, that implies that 230. This implies that this implies that 230 times three must be total. This must be the total, which is 690. And once we know the total, once we know the total number of people going on the cruise, the rest of the story is the same as before. The answer is D. The answer is D. Once we know the total people, we can figure out three quarter of them to figure out how many people are, or rather two thirds of them to figure out how many of those two of 690 are, are, are. As a matter of fact, I, I went in a very Ramanabhar way. I just realized that I went in a very damn silly way here. If 230 of them are guests and we know the guests are one third, then two thirds must be two times this amount. What a silly thing to do. I wasn't thinking. There's just 230 times 2, which is the remaining 2 third. And once we know how many of them are complete employees, we can figure out the quarter of that, and those are non-managers. Non Let's look at the next one, shall we? Number 117. Number 117. Number 117 is a pretty straightforward geometry question. There is nothing in it. We are told that the length of the edging around 
circular garden K happens to be one half of the length of the edging around circular garden G. Now the length of the edging around a circular garden is just a damn awkward way, it's a bloody awkward way of saying the circumference. Because if we have a circular, we have a garden which we are told happens to be of the shape of the circle. And this is the edging, this is the edging that they're talking about, this is the edging they're talking about, that's the circumference. So what they're telling us here is that, what they're telling us here is that the circumference of the circle K happens to be half of the circumference of the circle G. Well, if the circumference of circle K happens to be half of the circumference of circle G, of course that would also imply that the radius of circle K, radius of circle K would have to be half of the radius of circle G. For simple, very, for very simple facts, circumference is 2 times pi times the radius of the K, which has to equal to 1 half times 2 times pi times, times the radius of G. This is, this is unnecessary, I know that, but it's okay. Divide both sides by 2 pi and the 2 pi drops out and the radius of the k equals half of the radius of the g which is exactly what we have there. Let's see what they are asking. Let's see what they are asking. What they are asking is the area of k. Let's make a note here. They are looking for the area of k. How much is the area? How much is the area of the, of the circle k? Let's find out. In the first statement, Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. In the first statement they tell us that the area of G happens to be 25 pi. Area of G happens to be 25 pi which we know equals to pi r squared. Again pi will drop out and the radius of G that implies must equal pi. Well if we know the radius of G, if we know the radius of G, we can figure out the radius of K. Radius of K we know is half of that. It's half of that. And once we know the radius of K, we can figure out the area of K. Simple as that. That's all it is. It's just once we know the area, uh, radius of K, the area area of K is simply going to be pi r squared. Just substitute the value of pi over 2 and get the answer. That's all. The first statement by itself does the job quite nicely. The first statement does the job quite nicely. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself does the job nicely, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at the second statement. In the second statement, they go on to tell us that the circumference of the circle G, in the second statement, they go on to tell us that the circumference of the circle G happens to be 10 pi. Well, circumference we know is equals to pi r, r radius of the G. Again, if we divide both sides by pi, we find out that radius of the circle G is 5. Once we know the radius of circle G, once we know the radius of circle G, we can figure out the radius of circle K, which is just 5 over 2. It's half of that. And once we know the radius of circle K, we can figure out the area of K. Second statement by itself also is enough. The answer is D. The answer to this problem is D. Let's move on. Number 118. This was 117. As I said, this was a very straightforward, nothing to it, nothing creative about it, nothing novel about it, pretty banal, pretty ordinary, pretty pedestrian geometry question. The next one, however, is anything but pedestrian. And I know that most of you know the meaning of the word pedestrian as it was used just now in the context, but just in the event that there are some people who, do not un who did not understand the meaning of the word pedestrian in the context and would like to learn it, I'll give you the day number when we learned the word pedestrian, which was day number 13. Day number 13. Just type in GMAT vocabulary words. GMAT vocabulary words. Day 13 and the video will pop right up. Let's look at the next one. Number 118. In 118 we are told that let the minimum of XY 
be defined as as the minimum of x and y. Well, so far so good. Before they go on to tell us that let maximum of x y be defined as the as the maximum of x and y. So far so good. For example, before we actually do the work, let's do for example for example the minimum of 7 3 is simply the question here is which one which one of these two is a lower number? Minimum of these two values 3. Similarly, the maximum of 7 3 would equal 7. That's what it is. That's what it is. Let's see what they're asking. Question is question is for integer w for integer w what's the value of minimum 10 w this is what we're looking for what's the value of minimum 10 w you must understand you must understand what it is that we that we are looking for okay it's very important that from the very beginning you understand what it is that we're looking for otherwise you're going to end up wasting your time looking for precise value nobody is asking us to calculate anything here these questions are called data sufficiency we simply have to establish whether or not we have sufficient data to be able to answer the question here the only data that we require here is somehow we have to establish whether w is less than 10 or more than 10 well if w happens to be more than 10 let's say let's say let's say w happens to be let's say w happens to be something more than 10 in which case the minimum of 10 and something more than 10 would be 10 because this is the minimum similarly if w happens to be something less than 10 if w happens to be something less than 10 let's say 8 in which case the minimum would be 8 so we have to simply establish whether w is something more than 10 or less than 10 that's what we have to establish here do you understand now that we understand what we're dealing with, let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, in the first statement they tell us that the W happens to equal maximum of 20 and Z. W happens to, W, in other words, what they're telling us, if it makes it easier, if it makes it easier, in the first statement they tell us that W equals maximum of 20 and z. Now if it makes it easier for you, look at it this way. Take out from here and put it here. Maximum of 20 and 20 and z is w. Let's see what we can do with it. There are only two possibilities. Here, if z happens to be less than 20, if z happens to be less than 20, let's say z is equal to, let's say z is equal to 18. If z happens to be less than 20, in that case, the, the, then the maximum of 20 and z would equal 20, because z is 18, if z happens to be less than 20. On the other hand, if z happens to be something more than 20, let's say 27, if z happens to be 27, or if z happens to be more than 20, if z happens to be more than 20, then the maximum of 20 and something more than 20 would be 27. Let's replace it with z now. This is our z, you see? This is our z. In other words, in other words, in other words, if z is less than 20, well not in other words, I'm repeating the same thing what I said before, we're not saying anything differently. If z happens to be less than 20, then the maximum of these two quantities is going to be 20, obviously. But if z happens to be more than 20, then the maximum of these two quantities, 20 and z, z, if it happens to be more than 20, would maximum of these two quantities would be z. And this is what they're calling w. This, this is this, this quantity, this, this is w, this whole thing, this is what they're calling w. This is our w. This is our w. Keep listening. In other words, what we've established is that, what we've established is that there are only two possibilities. W, W is something, W is either exactly equal to 20, or W is something more than 20. Those are the only two possibilities. This, this quantity represents the value of W, they tell us. 
Max maximum of this, I should not have left it there, 27. This would cause confusion. Maximum of 20 and Z, maximum of 20 and Z is what they're calling integer W. So the W would have to be either exactly equal to 20 or something more than 20 if Z happens to be more than 20. Let's make a note of it. Let's make a note of it. In other words, in other words, maximum of 20 and z is something equal to 20 or is either equal to 20 or something more than 20. That is, that is, w is at least 20. This is what we establish here. What we establish here is that w would have to be at least 20. I need the room, so we're going to have to pick it up and do it on the top. Let's do it on the top. Let's pick it up from here. The question was this. What we're, what we're, what we're trying to answer is right here. Right here. What we're trying to answer is what's the minimum of 10 W? The minimum of 10 W is how much? That's the question. Which is same as saying, which is same as saying, what's the minimum of 10 and something, something more than 20? Because that's what our W is. Our W is at least 20. So, 10, minimum of 10 and W is same as saying minimum of 10 and something more than 20. Well, minimum of, of 10 and something more than 20, it doesn't matter what that more than 20 is, it doesn't matter what that quantity is, that more than 20, whether it's 21 or 21 billion, it doesn't matter. The minimum of this quantity is 10. There you go, we just answered it. The question was, are we able to answer how much is this guy? How much is this equal to? We just found out that it is 10, right here. The minimum of 10 W is 10 because we just found out that W is at least 20. From the very beginning, we realized that all we had to figure out is whether W is less than 20 or more than, or rather, from the very beginning, we had realized that we had to, all we had to establish was whether W is something less than 20 or more than 20. Well, I keep saying 20. Whether W was something less than 10 or more than 10. It turns out that forget about the 10, W actually, actually turns out to be at least 20. All we were interested in whether or not it is at least 10. It turns out that it is actually at least 20. Therefore, the minimum of these two quantities is 10. The first statement does the job quite nicely. The first statement does the job quite nicely. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now but the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Everything that belongs to the first statement has to be has to be gone. There we go. Everything is gone. Only the question is left. Let's see what they tell us in the second statement. In the second statement, they tell us that W happens to equal to maximum of maximum of Ten W. Ten W. Well, since since the maximum, since the maximum, since the maximum of ten W is not ten. It's not equal to 10. We are told that the maximum of these two quantity, maximum, maximum of maximum of 10 and W, the, the greater of the two number here is W. That's what they're telling us. The greater of these two numbers, 10 and W, the greater of these two numbers is W, which means that, which is another way of saying, another way of saying is that the maximum of 10 W is not equal to 10. It is W. It is not 10. It is W. It is W. It is not 10. That implies that implies that W must be must be more than 10. More than 10. W would have to be more than 10. Why? Why? Because if W were either equal to or less, they would not put an equal to situation because that would be confusing. 
Why would W have to be more than 10? Because if W happened to be less than 10, had the W been less than 10, then the maximum of 10 and something less than 10, if W had been less than 10, if W had been something less than 10, then the maximum of these two quantities would have been 10. Would have been 10. 10 versus something less than 10, the bigger of the two numbers is 10. But because we are told that the maximum of 10 and W is W, that tells us that this W, whatever it is, is bigger than 10. That tells us that W must be bigger than 10. W must be bigger than 10. Let's see what we can do with it. Can we answer our question? The question is this. What's the minimum of 10 and W? Well, we just found out that W is something more than 10. So this is same as saying, what's the minimum of 10 and something that is more than 10? Well, the minimum of these two numbers, 10 and something more than 10, of course, is 10. So it turns out that we are able to answer the question also by using the information from the second statement. Second statement by itself also does the job quite nicely. Also does the job quite nicely. The answer is D. The answer is D. The key to this kind of question, because it's not about math, it's not about math. The key to this kind of questions is to be able to think logically, rationally, calmly, under pressure. You must remain calm. You must remain collected. You must remain uh, non-agitated. Do you understand? You mustn't get nervous. Just think calmly, as I said, collectedly, logically, and you'll be fine. I'll see you, I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.